Uh, okay, in the meanwhile, I already um, introduced you, but uh, uh, now that you're here, uh, first of all, I say hi, Constantine. Hi. And um, in, in which country are you currently? I'm in Moscow. Okay. Uh, how's the situation in Moscow? Well, I'm not living in my apartment, so it's, I, I would okay. hardly know. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, uh, well, uh, so I know everything. Uh, I know all the same that everybody else knows uh -huh. from the news. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm trying to adjust the make on Windows, and uh, I'm kind of new to that. And, uh, no. Uh, uh, well, okay. no, no. I, I mean, I hear you very well. It's it's just a volume problem. If you manage somehow to lower it, it would be great. But otherwise, we can just continue. Um, so, I I always start by asking um, our guests to kind of introduce themselves by talking about uh, their background. So can you uh, can you talk a bit about your background? Uh, I've been working on a lot of databases. Uh, that's uh, pretty much all I do. Uh, I've been working on my SQL uh, for like eight years. And uh, then uh, I started uh, and a memory database, uh, so it's called Toronto, and uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a fun way to mix uh, uh, application programming and databases. So it's uh, it's it's that idea that you can uh, write your entire application inside your database. And uh, uh, a year ago, roughly a year ago, I joined Scylla. And Scylla is a very interesting project. It it has uh, a lot of common, a, a lot of things in common in architecture with Toronto. Uh, Toronto is in a memory database. Scylla is uh, uses uh, LSM, uh, mm -hmm. block structured merge trees to store data. So it's uh, similar to RoboDB, but otherwise it's from architecture point of view, it's also similar to Toronto because it's uh, uh, it has uh, Per core partitioning, what's called per core partitioning, you store, um, you split all your data uh, among CPU cores, and every CPU core is uh, exclusively responsible for a partition of mm -hmm. data. And I find it's a uh, very novel. Of, well, it's not too novel. Uh, I mean, VoltDB is using the same approach, and there are some others like uh, Redis is uh, single threaded, and uh, similarly, but. Uh, so that's uh, okay. Uh, okay, that's great. Um, so for those who maybe don't know uh, DB, uh, do you want to briefly explain what it is? Uh, from user point of view, it's uh, compatible with Cassandra. So it's a Cassandra replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's not like it's protocol level compatible. It's uh, 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 for example, uh, all the drivers uh, work out of the box. Uh, uh, all the tools work out of the box. Like there is a Cassandra Node tool, uh, which uh, allows you to work with uh, add and remove nodes and stuff like that. So that works out of the box. And uh, basically, it's uh, very well integrated into Cassandra ecosystem. I would say it's a member of Cassandra ecosystem. But under the hood, it's very different because it's written in C++. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, Scylla guys, um, uh, Avi and uh, Dor and the others, uh, they are orig original KVM guys. So they know a lot about operating systems. Mm -hmm. And Scylla under the hood is like a small operating system. It uses a C-star framework to do its own I.O. So it uses I.O. Uring for the model Linux uh, interface for I.O. Before it, it was fully a sync I.O. So it uh, uses the disk as a block device. It mm -hmm. doesn't use much of a file system. It uh, it used to work with the PDK, which is an Intel um, 
uh, Intel implementation, uh, Intel library to basically you can you have user space TCP IP. Mm. So it tried to do as much as possible uh, instead of the operating system so that operating, operating system doesn't stand in the way. And this is actually, you know, in many cases it can be quite good. So silicon extract more power, power more resources from mm -hmm. the system. So, so th there are two ideas, basically. You, you do per core partitioning, so you don't deal with any locks, and you try to do as much as possible using direct interfaces to hardware, so to, you avoid any you know, obstacles with that. And uh, well, in many cases, it's, uh, it's much faster than Cassandra. Cassandra is Java-driven, so mm -hmm. it uses garbage collection and you know all of this uh, that comes to it with tuning and stalls and stuff like that. So, so it's a pretty interesting technology, and uh, uh, it's growing to be more and more, you know, in more and more ecosystems. For example, now there is a Redis API for Scylla, uh, which I find quite interesting, and uh, it's uh, there is a DynamoDB API. Uh, that can run over Scylla. It's called uh, Alternator. So it's uh, so it's you know it's it's an it's like let's stop inventing a new uh, user experience. Let's uh, focus on technology. That's I if I, I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, Th this is interesting, and I think that. Uh, those who know Cassandra are uh, very interested in what you said because uh, uh, working with Cassandra, uh, especially means to have to pay attention to uh, configuring uh, correctly the heap memory, the the garbage collector, and so on. And uh, Knowing that SillaDB uh, is not written in Java is great for this reason. Um, but before digging into these kind of things, uh, it's possible that some of the people who's listening probably don't even know uh, Cassandra. So uh, do you want to maybe talk a bit about the data model of SillaDB? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, and, uh... So since uh, you could say it's a multimodal now because it uh, supports like uh, Dynamo and Redis, but at the core, there is of course the Cassandra data model. And uh, it's, uh, well, to be honest, I personally don't like it. So uh, let me explain why. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm an opinionated guy. So uh, I came from MySQL and mm -hmm. uh, MySQL is a classical relational database. Now there is a JSON support, so you can put JSON data into your database. Uh, there is Mongo model where you like have uh, documents and everything is a document. Cassandra is, uh, on one hand, it's more like a relational database, so it has a strict schema. You can have map types and the lists, and you can have map and list columns. So you can, in theory, you can put unstructured data into it just fine. Mm -hmm. However, uh, since it's a horizontally scalable database, uh, it's it has this idea that you um, you have two you you have you the, the the primary key that you use for your data has double meaning. And one, it it is used for uh, to decide what partition uh, mm -hmm. your data belongs to. So it's called the, that part of the primary key is called the partition key, and uh, uh, other key parts or uh, like if you have a composite primary key, they can be used as a clustering keys. So clustering keys define order within the partition. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to do uh, so many things. So, uh, the clustering keys, all the clustering keys of the same partition are partition local. So mm -hmm. if you manage to squeeze your problem into a single partition, then most of your writes and reads become uh, like partition local. They go to a specific node, they don't uh, incur any Cross node RPC and like your queries, which only work with a single partition, are extremely fast. Mm -hmm. However, the, the issue I have with it, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice idea uh, because it allows you to actually use a horizontally scalable database, but also it it allows you to. It's not just a key value, you know. It's uh, you you have more power. And mm -hmm. but what I don't like about it is that it's uh, all on S on and CQL level. 
So you have to define this, uh, you have to work, you, you don't define, like in SQL is very nice for separating the uh, you know, representation from storage. So mm -hmm. the way you, so the way you work with data doesn't change, even if you've changed like the way it's represented. Uh, you can add secondary keys, you can define, uh, you know, different index, index types like, uh, and so on. So uh, here it's uh, the data model actually, uh, and unites representation and the language. So you, you you have to be aware of clustering keys a lot to, to write efficient applications in Scylla. Uh, um, back when, uh, like this data model was uh, introduced, it, it was a very nice uh, compromise because, uh, you know, people needed scalable databases and they needed, uh, um, and they didn't need powerful also, I mean, more powerful database, just key value. Now I would uh, basically stick to, you know, plain tables and uh, make all of this uh, just an implementation detail that, hey, if you actually define a clustered index this way, your queries are going to be faster. That would be really nice. But uh, so so that's the that's the data model. Uh, it's close to relational. It uh, supports uh, queries over uh, efficient queries over you know multiple keys. Uh, it has of course secondary indexes and stuff like that now, and uh, it supports documents. But it's a little it's a little bit uh, making you think before you go. Basically, that's 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 how it works. Hmm. Uh Thanks a lot for sharing a uh, honest opinion because it's very nice to um, interview um, people who give us some expert opinions and not just marketing. So um, that's really great from you. Um, okay. Do you want to maybe give us a kind of high level overview of how SillaDB works internally? its architecture and so on. Uh, why not? Uh, so uh, the, the the basic building law block of the cluster is a node. And when you start Scylla, and even if you start a single node, you start observing the funny thing. All of your CPU cores are, are busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is because uh, Scylla by default uh, takes all of the resources you have Mm -hmm. uh, creates as many shards as you have core. Scylla shards is uh, like is physical operating system thread. So it's a thread per core model, and a single thread sits on a, is pinned to a single a CPU core. Mm -hmm. And uh, all your data is uh, like uh, partitioned across uh, these threads within a single process. You can add nodes, and uh, in Cassandra. Mm, you define uh, so very a very very nice thing about Cassandra and in Scylla is that you define uh, your data layout and your cluster layout. They, they, these are separate things. So when you define say you, when you create a table, uh, you say you or key key space, which is a schema in relational terms, uh, well a database. You you say how many copies of the data you want to have and uh, where these copies should reside. If you have Two data centers, you say, hey, I wanted to have three copies in this data center and three copies in this data center. And that's fine. And uh, then when you define uh, the topology, basically, you add nodes to the cluster, the data is moved automatically. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, the, we hear you well. Yeah, so uh, my laptop decided to hibernate for whatever reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so uh, your data is moved automatically as you add nodes. So, mm -hmm. from uh, from internal point of view, this demands like a certain components. Like the, 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 uh, you can send the query to any node, and it mm -hmm. is executed just fine, regardless of whether like uh, where the data resides. It's going to be routed by to the to the data internally if necessary. Mm -hmm. And so the, there is this uh, routing component which is called, is called in. Um, I can't hear you now. So uh, homogeneous execution, every okay. thread is equal. But other, other than that, uh, 
So you you get to the right node, data node, and then you uh, mm, you fetch the data. Basically, you process the data. You, you turn the data back. So another funny part of uh, an interesting part about the architecture is the way replication works. Mm -hmm. In uh, in uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and others, we are used to replicating the basically the commit log. Mm -hmm. And so the data gets written to the commit log, and then it's uh, the commit log is replicated across uh, nodes. Here, the query is basically replicated. So before it gets into the commit log, it's forwarded to replicas, uh, mm -hmm. and the replicas execute the query. It's uh, it, it has a um, so it's part of uh, Silly's eventual consistency. Uh, uh, idea so like it's it's part of Scylla's data model that uh every every change is assigned a timestamp and uh, you can basically uh, mm, reconcile mm -hmm. are you here yes i know I, I stopped seeing you by the way ah okay uh, let me see why oh sorry uh mm, let me check if it's fine on YouTube. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, you can continue. Okay. So, so that's uh, that's the second part. So, the replication is uh, is is working a bit different, and uh, that means that uh, Scylla is uh, in practice is very very durable. So, so it separates the consistency concern from durability concern, like. Uh, from consistency point of view, it's uh, an eventually consistent database. But from durability point of view, uh, most of your queries uh, execute on multiple nodes. Like you can, of course, say, "Hey, I want this to be only to have replication factor one," and in that case, it's local. But other than that, they execute on multiple nodes, and uh, uh, chances you you lose data are are pretty pretty low with Scylla. Mm. Okay, uh, very interesting. Um, from a user point of view, how easy is it to scale up adding nodes um, and also the opposite to mm, remove nodes and scale down? Um, well, you know, my experience with it was uh, a bit uh, sort of uh, bumpy. And, but that's because I'm using I'm like an old school guy and I'm I'm using the command line and uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to do everything from the command line and, and stuff like that. Uh, if you use uh, say Amazon or like just to give you an idea, there is a Kubernetes operator for Scylla. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a Scylla manager where you can just add a node and uh, and there you go. So. Uh, it can be very different, but the basic idea is that you simply add a node and or remove a node, and the data is uh, moved automatically. So you don't uh, you don't you are not concerned with the data movements at all. Okay, and in the meanwhile, uh, is the cluster slower? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's also one of the pluses of Scylla, like say over. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's efficiency that uh, there is a lot of investment in making the, all of these operations uh, mm, smooth and, uh, you know, to not impact the cluster. There are, of course, still uh, like cases when, uh, uh, mm, you know, customers or like users, they see uh, some issues, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I would say it's, uh, Compared to what we are used to, uh, you know, in, in uh, custom partitioning, like uh, or some. Mm. Okay, um, we have a question from Alexi um, about what you were uh, explaining before. Um, do Scylla transfer queries between local nodes in the same way as between remote nodes? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, remaining uh, again on the user point of view, um, I, I would like to ask you um, how compatible is is it in practice, uh, SillaDB with Cassandra? So, 
suppose that I switch uh, an application uh, from a Cassandra cluster to uh, SilaDB. How how much work is needed? W what would I need to do exactly? Uh, in most cases, your application uh, would not notice. Okay. But the, the question uh, you should ask yourself mm -hmm. is why you're switching. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, imagine you have a huge cluster which is running over, um, you know, rotating disks. Mm. And uh, you are not experiencing any of the like garbage collection. All of your workload is IO bound. In that case, you know, this the incentive to switch is, is low. So why? Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. No. Y yeah, yeah. I I can hear you. I I okay. think uh, everyone here. I do not hear you either. Uh, Maybe I should restart. <laughs> um. Okay. I I don't know how to. Yeah, but if you don't hear us, actually, it's better to restart. Okay, sorry, he is apparently having um, some more problems. Uh, it's a pity because we could hear him, but anyway, if he can't hear us, uh, it's not good because he can't hear the questions. Um, if you have uh, more questions, please write them in the chat. Uh, because I will ask them uh, as soon as possible. Okay, I hear he's coming. Okay. So, hey. Uh, Windows is uh, also not uh, without glitches, so. Okay, well, uh, um, I, I could hear you well, actually, but actually, if you can't hear me, it's a problem, so. Uh, now, now I can hear you. Okay, good, good, good. So, so okay. that's, that's that's the idea. You you know, uh, you should have an incentive to switch. And mm -hmm. if you're looking for extracting bigger performance uh, from Scylla, from Scylla, like from migrating to Scylla, you should also, uh, Scylla is more sensitive towards like imbalance in uh, in the workload because uh, it's, uh, so if in Cassandra, an entire, uh, node, an entire, a Java application on a specific node is responsible for the entire data set. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple threads can handle uh, queries against the same partition. In mm -hmm. Scylla, a single thread is handling a query against a single partition. So if your some of your partitions are very hot, you know, you have very un unbalanced load, then you may actually experience uh, some issues by migration, right? So, mm -hmm. But if your workload is like evenly distributed, uh, you are going to to extract like you can easily extract five uh, x, eight x uh, performance increase from moving to silence and also lower latency uh, mm -hmm. because of uh, there is no like, there is no garbage collection and stuff like that. Okay, good. You mentioned a couple of times um, secondary indexes. Um, and uh, in Cassandra, actually, secondary indexes are a common pain because uh, they are global and therefore they are therefore they are um, uh, slow. Um, is Still it has a global and local secondary index? Mm -hmm. and, okay, uh, so basically, can, can you explain this? Sorry, uh, if an index is available, if a local index is available, it's going to be. Like okay. It's, uh, like it's automatic. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, I'm not aware of any like slowness issues, but of course, uh, like uh, for example, materialized views. Materialized views is a kind of second index, and still it has, uh, uh, still it has uh, materialized views following the same similar design to Cassandra materialized views, and also similar issues like eventual consistency issues. Uh, some of the records they only eventually consistent in a materialized view, and uh, this is of course uh, like uh, very similar to Cassandra. Okay, uh, yeah, this is another feature that in Cassandra is often considered 
uh, very problematic in production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here mm. it's, uh, I mean, performance uh, is not everything. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah, I agree with you. And this is why, uh, this is why Scylla uh, uh, is moving towards like, uh, you know, beyond Cassandra, uh, adding mm. features. So for example, now we are, uh, it's been a long uh, way already and we continue on that. We are working on uh, uh, transactional tables, basically raft tables. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are making progress uh, on that. And I hope uh, one day still it will be just, uh, you know, similar to what you're used to in MySQL in terms of like consistency models and, uh, uh, you know, features that you expect and, and so on. So it's okay. a question of the roadmap, and I'm, of course, not the person who is defining the roadmap, but uh, at least I can share what I work on. Okay. We have a, um, a request for clarification from the chat. Uh, what did you mean by you need to pay, sorry, you need to pay attention on cluster key on application level? Oh, uh, I mean, when you create, when you construct a query, uh, say you 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 have to uh, restrict the clustering key, say, and the partitioning key, and it's part of the CQL. You specify in CQL like here is a bit between a certain specific clustering key and a partition key. In that case, it works. If you don't, uh, if uh, if you say you want to change uh, your uh, if you tomorrow you can change your clustering key. Once you once you once you uh, laid uh, laid out your so imagine uh, compare it say with Mongo in, in Mongo you just start ingestion data and then you define what to do with it you can define a schema you can define the indexes and so on here if you do it like that uh, you you need to move the you you can't move the data it's uh, it's already there it's already partitioned uh, the way you defined, uh, you, according to the schema you defined up front. So it requires more investment. Up front. That's what I was trying to say. Hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, uh, t uh, transactional tables. Um, this is interesting and this leads us maybe to a more generic question. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, the unique features of Scylla that are not in Cassandra? Um, well, uh, the number one would be uh, that I would identify uh, is workload prioritization. So because of the underlying operating system features, mm -hmm. uh, we can actually say how much uh, uh, what we could call shares or priority every user or workload gets. Mm. So that's uh, that's very useful if you want to run uh, some, you know, map reduce workload or uh, uh, workload which touches every row in the cluster and you want to make sure it doesn't impact, uh, doesn't impact uh, your OLTP part, mm. so your OLTP application. So uh, that's, uh, that's number one. Uh, Generally, you know, there, like for example, I spend time uh, uh, implementing lightweight transactions in in Scylla, mm -hmm. and uh, there are lots of changes in the way lightweight transactions are supported in Scylla compared to Cassandra. Mm -hmm. So they are they are more efficient in certain in certain uh, uh, ways. Like uh, they require fewer rounds. Uh, they work with the facts uh, stable differently and so on. So there are details in how certain features impl are implemented. But uh, generally, Scylla uh, started as a Cassandra compatible database. So it, it defines a lot what it does and what features it has. Mm. Okay. Um, I see that you also support uh, in-memory tables, right? Mm, maybe that's ah, uh, okay. that's uh, that's possible. That's uh, uh, okay. I think this is someone I've read somewhere. So uh, no, no. Actually, actually the... now that I think about it, um, it is possible that I missed that in the code. But uh, oh. um, 
I, you know, the way I interact with the database is not from the user manual or from like trying to deploy it and play of with course. it. Is by yeah. looking at the code. So I might yeah. get some of the of the details. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I was simply curious because this is something that um, I believe Cassandra only has in the non-open source uh, version. Oh, okay. the data that's that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I was curious if uh, this was the only case, or maybe it's part of your strategy. Actually, uh, that's uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm coming from an in-memory world, and latency is a, is the king for in-memory. The reason people choose in-memory databases is that they want predictable, stable latency, regardless of what workload they run. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scylla is actually fulfilling this promise to a large extent. Hmm. It uh, doesn't give you like one or two millisecond latency, one which you could get from an in-memory database, but it gives you a predictable like five millisecond latency because of the mm -hmm. modern, modern SSD device. So uh, I would actually question uh, the need for in-memory tables and still or using in-memory tables. Because like, why wouldn't you just use standard tables? So uh, it, it gives you good enough results on uh, like an, on a modern cloud, any modern cloud. Uh, if you look at the Amazon, it starts uh, working over NVMe devices, and uh, latency of such a device is, is actually excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, a uh, couple of questions from the chat. Uh, one is about uh, materialized views again, and uh, uh, it asks if they are eventual consistent. Yes, yeah. So, so you, you you write to the base table, and uh, the write to the materialized view uh, is eventually consistent. Okay. Um, Oh, okay, another question is how is data stored in SillaDB? Uh, or um, it asks if it is row oriented or columnar. It's row. It's a row store. So log, struc uh, log structured merge trees are uh, they're essentially a tree. So it, it's similar to B tree, but very much uh, write optimized. So when you write a record to Scylla, you store it in the mem table, uh, which is an unmemory representation similar to level DB and, and such. Uh, you store it in the mem table. When this mem table gets too many uh, changes, which are called mutations in uh, mm -hmm. uh too many updates, it's, it's uh, being flushed or dumped to disk. And mm -hmm. the separate uh, process, which is called compaction, uh, is running in the background uh, to uh, use the waste of uh, multiple log logs, which are memory tables. It compacts multiple logs into a single one and, and so on and so on. There are different compaction strategies similar to Cassandra, like time window leveled and uh, and so on. So incremental compaction and, and so on and so on. So you define depending on the type of data you have, you can you can pick that. But uh, well, that's that's basically it. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um... A, cur a curiosity from me: um, Is it possible for an application to uh, connect uh, using ODBC driver or JDBC driver? No, no. Okay. But that's uh, that's on our list. That would be quite fun. But uh, in order to provide it, uh, you know, I'm I know a little bit about ODBC, JDBC, and generally. SQL-based connectivity. I, I used to be maintaining uh, uh, MySQL C API and mm -hmm. uh, preparing prepared statements there. That's where my journey started. And uh, in Toronto, Toronto actually supports ODBC. Okay. Uh, so I know, but to, to some extent, what, uh, what it takes. And, mm. uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's supporting the data types uh, from NC, SQL, mm -hmm. uh, supporting information schema, Transaction control. Uh, the the most ODBC uh, applications begin by fetching the information schema from the database. So uh, these features are not yet, I hope, yet present in Scylla, and uh, they will appear eventually. Scylla has an internal data dictionary, so uh, unlike uh, you know the old times of MySQL, which started with FRM table, FRM files, and stuff like that, Scylla mm -hmm. starts by storing all the metadata in system table. 
So it's uh, the it, the observability is actually excellent, I would say. So you have all the data in the system tables. You have lots of metrics and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of stuff is ready, but it's not in the schema that ODBC expects. Okay. So, I mean, so that's just one obstacle. The data types that are supported are not exactly ANSI data types. So they're close, but, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, another thing, um, again, from user point of view, uh, do you have maybe uh, some good practices to suggest uh, or bad practices uh, not to suggest uh, to both um, database administrators and uh, developers? Of Scylla? Yeah. Uh, well, I'd say uh, do not begin by uh, try, do not begin like the old school way. Try to use a Kubernetes, try to use uh, Amazon Cloud, try to spin off a few instances from MEI, just to give you an example. That would make the entire setup much, uh, much uh, smoother. Uh, Scylla has uh, excellent MEIs, which self-tune. Mm -hmm. So basically you select the machine and you get the optimal performance for that machine. If you try to do it on bare metal and you try to do it my, yourself, you need to set up NICs, set up storage. Uh, you need to, uh, Scylla has a, a, a file which is called Scylla YAML. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, it, and another one is called uh, iTunes YAML. Mm -hmm. And iTunes is the file that defines uh, the uh, performance characteristics of the storage. So there is a separate application that has to be run to actually test the storage so that still works in an optimal way within that particular device. Hmm. And you have, and uh, generally, if you don't provide it, it still won't start. But uh, you know, so you have to uh, do it. You have to do it uh, for all of the nodes in the cluster. You know, it, the nodes have to be balanced. If different nodes, for example, have different number of CPU cores, you you will have issues because you know they will not keep up with each other, and uh, some of the nodes will be overloaded and so on. So, uh, so starting from uh, a cloud or uh, using uh, some of the existing tools to configure your cluster would be a, a, you know a good idea. Hmm. Uh, other than that, uh, Scylla is Cassandra. So all of the tutorials, all of the examples, all of the best practices uh, apply. If you okay. use, in, you know, in DynamoDB mode, in alternator mode, it's, it's just the same. Like it's, it's the same uh, rule of thumb. If you look at how what's the best practices with DynamoDB and apply it here. Okay, good. Okay, so you worked, uh, you already mentioned you worked for uh, MySQL and Terran tool before. So basically, uh, I think one can say you always worked for uh, open source databases. Um, how important is for you open source? And how important is open source for those projects? I ask this also because you know many open source databases at some point uh, switched to less open licenses and stuff yeah. like that. So uh, um, yeah, it's uh, and I will begin by mentioning that thank you for asking Peter Zaitsev my question about uh, uh, about his take of different communities and uh, if you look at the. What you said, you said like, hey, PostgreSQL has an excellent community where, despite competing, every part, every member of the community is endorsing uh, each other because it's first of all endorsing PostgreSQL, and making the community grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and I've been on, uh, you know, uh, I started at MySQL as an engineer in Toronto. I was responsible for the business side of things, so I would come out uh, to some enterprises and say, hey. Why don't you pay us for an open source database? And uh, Toronto is actually a BSD, so it's even harder to extract uh, money from from clients. But you you give out everything for free. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been like on the both sides of this. Uh, I think and it's uh, extremely hard for open source software to survive, especially in presence of cloud. Mm. 
uh, like the the competition uh, from the cloud is uh, really unfair because they don't they don't open anything. You don't have to open anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, and still, I think that uh, obviously, I think that open source is extremely important, mm -hmm. and uh, I cannot imagine myself working uh, on a closed source project after being having spent twenty years on open source. Okay. Like I started in 2000 on MySQL and then Toronto and now Scylla. So, and regarding the different licenses and, and, and the community, I'm all for, uh, I'm all for uh, vendors uh, uh, to make money mm -hmm. uh, and uh, invest that money into the, uh, into the product. Uh, I'd say that um, money there has been a lot of inflation of the value of the open source because of the uh, venture uh, venture uh, capital and investment into the database. Like we have 400 products. It's uh, the business model of most of these project, products and projects is like venture capitalists as a, as a customer, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them, obviously most of them will not graduate uh, into, uh, into successful businesses. Uh, so um, I'd say that uh, like uh, finding the right balance is quite tricky. It has to be done and the vendors have to be supported for their, uh, like I fully support, for example, uh, Monty and Marie DB's uh, attempts to come up with the business source license and, 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 and like innovate on that front. It has to be done. Otherwise we will not hit the right balance with the cloud and uh, like just uh, freemium databases and stuff like that. Hmm. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, um, SillaDB uh, receives many code contributions? Uh, no, not really. And uh, okay. I, and uh, uh, so it depends. Uh, like hmm. code contribution could be in the driver, right? And uh, it mm -hmm. could be in uh, a bug report. It could be in an article. So. Uh, still has uh, plenty of that, but it's never plenty. It's never enough, but it has it. But with the code, still uses the latest C++. The core of the of the database is written in uh, in um, using the futures model, so it's future based programming. Mm -hmm. uh, future based programming in C++ is difficult. It's really really tough, mm -hmm. and uh, contributing code is uh, is not easy. So you have to be you know, I I I thought I know I know C plus plus before I joined, uh, but my C plus plus was twenty years old. It's uh, I could uh, basically throw it into the garbage bin. Uh, all of my knowledge and learn from scratch. Okay. Amazing. Um, so, so, if one of the people who's listening uh, wants to try to contribute, uh, can you suggest where to start from? Um, <laughs> that's a tough question, you know. It's like uh, okay. I'd say start from stuff that's interesting to you. So okay. it's uh, you know it's uh, because I could suggest some easy parts uh, like uh, adding. Uh, I started at my SQL by adding uh, uh, some distinct or something like that. A new function, mm -hmm. a new group function, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's easy because you only work on the uh, on the query execution layer. Query execution doesn't have all of the issues of system programming. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it op it operates in in a certain environment, in in you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's one approach. But uh, I think you should start with what's interesting to you, and then go from there. Okay. <laughs> Someone wrote in the chat, um, the problem with C++ is that nobody knows C++. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah. But uh, so on the other hand, uh, um, projects, as they mature, they uh, decide on a subset of C++ that they use. So they decide on this subset that most of the contributors know, 
Mm -hmm. uh, Scylla is not there. Scylla is on the bleeding edge of C++. For example, right now we are adopting C++20 with modules and uh, coroutine. Uh, we badly need coroutines to make our code easier to understand. Uh, they play nicely with C star framework and uh, with the futures, and they make the the object lifetime, understanding the object lifetime much easier, so we need them. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. But I'd say, like, uh, let's discuss this a few years from now, and uh, maybe there will be a, like, a stable subset of uh, C++ that still settles on. It'll be easier. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. <laughs> Talking about the difficulties of C++, um, is it better or, I mean, not really better, is it uh, easier or harder than Lua? <laughs> you can learn Lua, Lua in one day, you know. You don't even need to learn it, you just start writing in it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lua has some gotchas, but they are nowhere near, like, uh, the, the stuff you can get with C++. Okay. Um, for the people who's listening and maybe doesn't know, uh, I asked this because Tarantul is written in Lua, right? Oh, and actually it's a myth. Uh, Tarantul is written Sorry? in C. Uh, we started uh, Tarantul oh. in, in writing in Tarantul in Objective-C. Okay. Objective -C, and then we turn it into... Uh, Objective-C is a very nice language. It has a small talk like dispatch. Uh, method dispatch. So it's a, in a way, it's a duck type uh, compiled language. Uh, mm -hmm. But then uh, GCC support of Objective C, Objective C was so bad, we moved on to plain C. So Toronto, the core of the database is written in C. And okay. from contribution point of view, it's much much easier than C plus plus. So if you want to contribute to Toronto, I guess you find easier time. Okay, and. Um... Can you do you know why I was so sure that it's uh, it's written in Lua? Uh, because you interact with it in Lua. It's uh, oh, okay. It, everything is uh, is the front end. It's Lua. You, yeah. it, there's SQL support and Lua support, so you you wouldn't even like. Uh, why yeah. would you wonder that? It's, uh... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the application server and the database querying is all in Lua, but the yeah. core is actually C. Okay, yeah. interesting. Um, okay, well, we actually exceeded our time, but you know, we also uh, wasted some time at the beginning. So, if you are not in uh, in hurry, I have a final question, um, which is about lockdown, because well, I suppose that you work at remotely for most of your life, if not always. <laughs> Uh, but for some people, this is a change, right? So they were used to go to the office every day, and uh, now they are forced to work remotely. And uh, for some teams, it's probably uh, not so easy to find an optimal way to do it. Uh, do you have some suggestions for them? Well, I, I work both remotely and uh, uh, I work from from an office uh, while I work for Toronto. Mm. Um, you know, it's uh, there is no. Uh, I think every person is different. Uh, mm. You, I could repeat some some of the usual stuff that's uh, that's plenty now. That's, that's everybody is writing about it. Uh, for me, working remotely is uh, both efficiency mm -hmm. because uh, I don't have to spend time uh, to travel, but uh, I have to I have to be very strict about my work life balance. Right, I'm not mm -hmm. good at. But uh, but still, so uh, like if you go to the kitchen in the office and you have a snack, you don't count it as a leisure time, right? Because it's just a small break. Yeah. Uh, but when you work from home, it becomes a nightmare because like, uh, how do you account this time? Uh, and if, if a kid uh, comes to you and asks you to help with uh, with some toy or with something, then then suddenly it's an interruption and you have. You have to, you know, you feel guilt or or, or shame or whatever, or, or not. So 
Uh, yeah. but, uh, the lockdown is, is tough. I think uh, it's ni nice to have uh, all of the processes and businesses around the world change with the lockdown. Mm -hmm. I don't go to groceries anymore. I don't need to leave the house anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to leave the house. I love going outside and so on. So I'd separate this. Like, uh, it's nice to work from home, but it's also nice to go out and uh, meet people and uh, you know, have all this new kind of, uh, all, the, all the different kind of interactions with people. It's... Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Uh, I often talk to people who tell me, you know, well, I, I spend most of the, my time in front of my laptop, but it's not a big change compared to before. <laughs> well, for me, it is a change, actually. <laughs> uh, anyway. For me, it's like an avalanche of, uh, of, uh, of uh, everything, every, everything I learn now, every, everything I find out now. I learn and find out from like the internet. There is no face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah. So my my no, my time in front of computer and not in front of computer, uh, even further changed towards being most of the time in front of the computer. Even if they just wanted to read the news or or you know, and and things like that. Uh, so no lockdown is not nice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I close uh, all these interviews with a very, very final question uh, about books, because we all have a lot of time for, well, most of us have a lot of time for reading now. Um, so let's do it. Uh, do you have some uh, books to suggest? And in particular, what I ask is always one book about databases and another book about anything. Um, so I'd say that, uh, you know, um, I've been doing database programming and programming in general, and uh, also some people uh, management and, and, and things like that uh, in the evangelism uh, for quite a while now. And uh, you ask yourself, what's, uh, what makes, what drives you, what makes you happy? uh at work at home and and uh in your career and to me the most influential book that uh, i read about it was uh i'm not sure i'm going to pronounce uh, uh, it's the flow the flow is a book by mihaly chiksent mihaly i think that's the way you pronounce it mm. so okay. uh, he introduced that concept of the flow actually so mm -hmm. what we call the flow like when you are deeply focused on is the it was introduced by uh, uh, the author of this book. So I recommend uh, it to everyone who wants to say understand a little bit the purpose of uh, what uh, what they do and how to become happy doing that. And for databases, no, there like the recent book that. I warmly recommend to everyone is about uh, what's that? It's, it's called high performance computing or distributed computing. Uh, mm. Let me Google it. It's just uh, I think it's a good summary of the changes in the. So the problem with the database books is that they are very academic. So oh, yeah, and the, most of the stuff you read, like I could. Uh, I recommend a bunch of academic books like uh, Bernstein and Newcomer Transaction Processing or the uh, mm, uh, Transactional Information Systems by, so like you could recommend the book by uh, Stonebreaker on, mm -hmm. uh, on transactional databases. But, like there are so many uh, classical yeah. books. Uh, Actually, um, Marco, Marco Makela suggested uh, exactly that book, saying that uh, InnoDB is mostly based on those concepts. Uh, yes, uh, that's true. So, uh, 
okay. You know, it's it's interesting to uh, it's interesting to to those who. Uh, so the book is called Designing Distributed Systems. Okay. Or not? No. I completely forget. I read a lot, and uh, I read it, uh, you know, months ago. But you can do something if you prefer. You, you could, uh, when you find the title, maybe later, maybe tomorrow, maybe in yeah. a week, you, you write it in the comments and uh, people sure. will see it. Sure, sure. Okay. So nowadays I mostly read non-programming books because uh, it's, uh, the stuff on programming. I spent a lot of time watching Leslie Lamport videos on Paxos to understand uh, some of the nuances of Paxos. And uh, getting them from the papers was nearly impossible. So, like, this is how you learn about databases now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we greatly exceeded our time, but it was really a pleasant time, I think. Uh, thank you a lot for this great thank interview. Thank you for your questions. And um, my pleasure. And I just want to remember everyone that two weeks of databases and tomorrow with a final interview to Monty, which is the creator of MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, between other things, uh, I seem to remember I will have a question from, uh, from you uh, for Monty, right? Right. Good. Okay, so um, bye, Constantine. And, Thank you, and uh, uh, have a nice day. And uh, if you can enjoy the isolation, then try. <laughs> yeah, we also should try. Cheerio, bye. Bye-bye.